Let's bring on Connor Mulvaney, who's running for local office in Pittsburgh. And we've got to elect more Greens locally and, and build from the bottom up so we can take power from these fools that are running the country now. So welcome, Connor. And uh, you know, tell us about yourself and your campaign and what some of the issues are in your in your campaign. Yeah, thanks, Howie. Uh, it's it's an honor to be here. I'm I'm so excited to be talking to to you and everyone that's listening live and folks that are going to be listening later. Uh, so my name is Connor Mulvaney. I'm running for Pittsburgh City Council District Four, uh, which, if anyone's familiar with Pittsburgh, sort of like the southern edge of of the city itself. And uh, I have been a member of the Green Party for a little bit over a year and a half now, I suppose. Uh, I was a volunteer for Bernie Sanders' campaign. I was an environmental constituency organizer with his campaign in Pennsylvania. And unfortunately, it uh, didn't go the, the way that I think a lot of folks wanted to. I think probably a lot of people can uh, sympathize with that that are listening now. And uh, so I, I needed a place to put my energy, right? Um, and of course, his campaign ended a, a little bit before uh, protests started happening around the country and, and in Pittsburgh. And when those started happening, I realized that the Green Party is out there advocating for not just racial justice, but um, environmental justice, uh, for climate justice, um, immigration justice. I mean, you, you name it, the Green Party had a hand in it in Allegheny County in the city of Pittsburgh. And I saw a pretty stark reflection of my own values and what the Green Party was was working on in uh, in the city of Pittsburgh. So um, I, I jumped right in. You know, I, I was marching with those folks just about every week. Um, there were weekly protests going on in the city of Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, we really got to know each other as, as individuals and um, as not just people, but as, as political individuals, too, as political creatures. And uh, I met most of my team at those protests. Um, and it's been a really cool experience to to grow a campaign out of that. Um, you know, we we remodeled our um, Green Party of Allegheny County uh, platform after the protests last year. Tried to include some more justice focused uh, policies and uh, really just expand all the things that you know the Green Party has always been for, but try to make it more responsive. I think to you know the current climate that we live in with the pandemic and, <clears throat> and excuse me, the social unrest um, and just trying to, you know, carve out a path forward. And we just never stopped. Um, towards the end of the year, a lot of people were getting involved in Pittsburgh in budget discussions. Um, protesters who were once in the streets, especially once the pandemic started picking up, you know, started moving indoors to Zoom to budget hearings and the incumbent for the seat that I'm running for now, Anthony Coghill, uh, came on one budget meeting and said to, I, I guess he thought it was just his, uh, his peers and not everyone attending the meeting, well, what's the bad news? And it, it shook me after a year or a full summer of people trying to engage with local government and trying to tell city government what we wanted and what we wanted to see change that anybody would see participation in local government as a bad thing. It, it, it still shocks me. I mean, we need more civic engagement, not less, much less elected officials bullying people out of engaging, right? Um, so that, that was kind of what sparked me to run. Um, I had my own challenges <laughs> trying to engage with, uh, with my city council person. Um, I'm a bike ped advocate outside of the work that I do with the Green Party. Um, advocating for bicycle infrastructure, better public transit, safer sidewalks, more accessibility. And um, frankly, the incumbent has never wanted to hear it. We've been advocating for improvements at one intersection around the corner from my house for two years where a young man died, a young father of a, of a son. Haven't, haven't heard a word. Um, and we're still trying to, to get engagement on, on that front. So it, it lit a spark. I, I had a lot of friends that were willing to take the plunge with me and decided to, to go and run. And I mean, it's, it's been incredible, the momentum that we were able to build in, in the early running, we were able to get on some candidate forums with uh, not just the incumbent, but his other challengers in the Democratic Party. And, um, you know, we've just been racking up endorsements, racking up fundraising, we've, we've been 
doing a good job there, but we can always do better, um, especially whenever you're running up against a candidate that just gives himself 40 or 50 K every time he wants to run. Um, you know, we're, we're doing good. We're hanging in there and, and it's great that, you know, you're all, uh, you know, helping me out, you know, the, the support that we've gotten, not just from the national green party, but the state green party greens from West Virginia and Ohio, um, has just been incredible. Um, so, you know, thank you for, for that and, uh, continuing to support us and you specifically Howie for paving the way for us. Um, it's, it's still blowing my mind that, <laughs> that I'm here on this show with you. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, I would, uh, urge people has it come up on the comments to go to Connor's website and throw him a few dollars and, uh, phone bank for him. I phone bank for him last Tuesday. Uh, he's got another session this Wednesday. Uh, I don't have the link for that yet, but I think if you go to the website and sign up as a volunteer, uh, they will let you know. Um, so this is a serious campaign, and he's got quite a list of endorsements. Why don't you tell us uh, who endorsed you there in Pittsburgh? Yeah, I, uh, I hope I don't miss anybody. Um, the Pittsburgh chapter of Democratic Socialists of America have been a, a huge help. Um, you know, I've, I've um, you know, gotten a lot of excellent advice from them, excellent support from, you know, the, the folks that are heavily involved with there. They've been helping us with phone banks, door knocking, research, um, just incredible help that we've gotten from the DSA. I, I can't express my thanks for them enough. Um, but also the Sunrise Movement, um, No Cop Money PA, um, Recently, we were endorsed by the Pennsylvania and Allegheny County chapters of the Sierra Club. Um, we've gotten some great local endorsements from activists like Claire Cohen, um, Mike Stout. Um, Cam Gordon has endorsed our campaign. Um, geez, yeah. I mean, it, we've, we've been building... Oh, Socialist Alternative. Sorry, can't, for, can't forget those folks. Um, we've, we've been building a coalition, like one that hasn't been seen in Pittsburgh before. Um, you know, I, to my knowledge, we've not seen all of those leftist organizations coalesce into, into, um, you know, one, one campaign. So it's, um, it's proven to be a force, you know, it's, it's certainly already achieved more than I thought was possible, but, uh, it's, it's really, really exciting to, to see the momentum that we've built and we're not done. I mean, you mentioned that we have some phone banks coming up. Um, I think that we have a, a link out there. Um, if you go to the website slash calendar, yep, right there, um, you know, you'll be able to find phone banks, door knocking. This morning we had a potluck, actually. Um, I wasn't able to, to be there, unfortunately, but I heard there was donuts. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're having fun and uh, getting a lot of folks out there, a lot of folks that, um, you know, haven't, haven't been as engaged before or haven't been engaged in this way. And, you know, I think that's what it's all about. If me as a candidate can change one person's mind about how they think about the Green Party, local politics, um, city council, if, if I can change one person's mind, then I've done my job. And, you know, it seems like we're changing a lot of folks' minds or at least getting them to think a little bit differently. So as you go around your district, what are the issues that people uh, want you to deal with the most? That's that's a good question. So um, in my district, a huge concern for a long time has been road conditions, um, whether you can uh, get a snowplow on your street. My street was actually on the news at the end of last winter for being the last street plowed in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, that's usually important to people. Um, you know, it's, it's important to me personally. I, I ride a bike almost everywhere I go. It's my primary mode of transportation. And if the streets aren't clear or if it's not safe, to go out there, I, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so the incumbent ran on, uh, uh, I guess, catchphrase of back to basics four years ago. And even in that time, what's what's he been working on that's more basic than snow removal? <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to find an answer to that question. Um, you know, even, even someone whose whole, whole deal was doing the bare minimum and, and we can't get a snow plow in the southern edge of the city of Pittsburgh is, is absurd. Um, so I'm diving headfirst into, into doing that. I mean, my 
my livelihood, my uh, safety depends on clear streets as well. Um, so we've been talking a bit about that. Um, a lot of folks are concerned with how a lot of members of council, my opponent included, are frankly just bought and sold, right? So uh, in Pittsburgh, our largest employer, I believe in the state of Pennsylvania as well, the largest employer is um, the UPMC Healthcare Network. And uh, my opponent has received donations from, um, I think, a couple of different sources, uh, healthcare packs. Uh, in my opinion, that's a direct conflict of interest, um, you know, compared to the things that I want to advocate for. Those uh, corporations that are dishing out money and, and, frankly, running city council, they don't pay taxes uh, in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, that was part of a deal cut with leaders, uh, I believe in the late 80s or early 90s, to, to not force these corporations to take taxes to try to pull the city of Pittsburgh out of the slump after the collapse of the steel industry. And we're paying for it now. You know, these corporations are huge and we don't have a lot to show for it. They don't pay their people well. They're union busting. They take up a huge, huge, huge footprint in the city of Pittsburgh. And it's a lot of tax money that we're just letting them walk straight out the door and my opponents being paid by them. So um, a lot of people see that as wrong. A lot of people want someone that's going to advocate for them. Um, I think that a lot of people that are already engaged in our part of town, whether you're advocating for clean air, clean water, safe streets, um, you know, you, you name it. If you're advocating for something in the south end of Pittsburgh, uh, you probably run into my opponent who will blow you off laugh you out of his office, tell you it's not a problem, uh, and then let the issue die. And uh, it's just unacceptable. I mean, it goes back to the, the story about the budget meeting. How, how can you claim to want to serve and treat people that way? It's, it's absolutely absurd. Um, and people recognize that, you know, especially the ones that are, that are engaged that have tried to advocate for something because it's, it's happened to them. They've been turned away when all they want to do is try to improve their neighborhood. And, you know, I, I want to be the opposite of that. I'm there to, to listen. I'm not considering myself a policy expert on, on anything, but I want to talk to people. There are policy experts out there, people who, you know, are living and aren't able to access the neighborhoods the same way that I am as, you know, an able-bodied person. Um, you know, the, I'll never know what it's like to, um, you know, be a black person in America, but there are people who are advocating for racial justice those people need to be listened to by people in power. And if the people in power don't want to have anything to do with even just talking about these issues, they got to go, period. You know, I think people should realize that uh, Pittsburgh, like a lot of cities in this general election, there are four district council seats up and no Republicans are running because they can't win in the cities. And three of the four Democrats up who are incumbents have no opponent. You're looking at the only person in Pittsburgh challenging the incumbents. And what does that say to the Green Party? There's a lot of opportunity for us there. You get an election, you have a platform, you can raise issues that the establishment is not. So that's just an appeal to people like, look at where you live and you will find unopposed candidates just, you know, election after election being elected, or even if the Republicans put up an opposition, it's token. And usually in those circumstances, they're not people the Republicans vetted. So you get, you know, conspiracy theorists, cranks, crackpots, and Greens usually beat those candidates and come in at least second. So, uh, you know, Connor stepped into a void that a lot more Greens need to step into. And shout out to uh, our friends in the Green Party of England and Wales uh, who um, gave us the, the idea, and I think they gave us the template as well, a physical template for a 60 second survey that we've been using um, and just handing to people at the doors and either having them email it back to us or, or hand it back to us on the spot. Um, people, people just want to be listened to. And even if you disagree with what a person is fundamentally saying, uh, at least in, in our particular circumstance, even just listening gets you, you know, a foot in the door or 
you know, they're willing to listen to what you have to say because people are just so used to, you know, either politicians picking their constituents or good old boys with a whole lot of money and a whole lot of old power that, um, you know, think they can just coast on through. And if you can slow that down just a little bit and pick up some momentum yourself, yeah, it's totally possible that Greens out there can win anywhere. And that's something that we've found too, is when we're able to talk to people, we get a lot of folks that, that, you know, commit to commit to voting for us. And we say it all the time. I think I told you this on uh, Monday, Howie, or said it to the, to the phone banking group, but when we talk to our neighbors about these issues, these things that we care deeply about, we win their votes. And it's really just a matter of talking to enough people. It's quite, quite literally a numbers game. And, uh, you know, we're, we're playing it that way. And that's why volunteering to phone bank or, you know, donating so that we can, uh, you know, squeeze a little bit more out of the dialer, um, you know, is, is so important in races like mine. I know that uh, housing is a big issue everywhere. Uh, wages increased by 3% last year nationwide. Housing costs by 23%. And you've got these private equity firms like BlackRock buying up all the Homes that go on the market, turn them into rental homes. Uh, in Berlin, they passed a advisory referendum to expropriate, I think it was 200,000 uh, homes that are owned by the biggest landlords and turn them into uh, publicly owned homes through the public housing authority there. We'll see if they follow through on that. Um, I think that's a great idea for us to start raising here. But, you know, tell us about your program to deal with housing in Pittsburgh. Because I know it's got to be an issue like it is everywhere. It It is. Um, Pittsburgh, I, I couldn't tell you what the, the figures exactly look like. Um, but I think it's clear to the naked eye, if you've ever visited Pittsburgh, that it's it's certainly rapidly gentrifying. Um, it's certainly not the, uh, the Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, the, the 90s, early 2000s that were just bleeding people. Um, but the, the housing situation is dire. Um, our district has had one of the highest rates of eviction since the pandemic started, and it, it doesn't appear to be slowing down. Um, you know, the city of Pittsburgh has had some, some mild, uh, eviction protections. Um, they certainly could have been better. And, uh, unfortunately, none of them are, none of them are permanent. We need a permanent solution to this housing issue. This issue of just bleeding people that already live here, that have historically lived here. And the only way to do that is really by ensuring that there's affordable housing. Now, the latest thing to come through Pittsburgh City Council is a measure that would essentially allow city council members themselves to block specific developments. Sounds interesting on its surface, um, but let's assume that, uh, say my opponent would, would have this power. This guy is being paid by developers already, um, you know, to essentially do their bidding in, in city council. Now, if he is the only rubber stamp that has to be on a development before it gets approved, I, I mean, it's, it's game over to our neighborhoods as we know it, unfortunately. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't trust this guy, most most people in city council, I wouldn't trust most members of Pittsburgh City Council to approve or deny developments because they're not housing activists, they're not city planners. How how can we possibly allow them to to have that power? The only thing that is going to ensure that Pittsburgh has affordable housing is strong requirements for affordable housing for every development, um, and not market based affordable housing, it needs to be based on median income and at a percentage of median income that's reasonable. 80% of median income is way too high. <laughs> For a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening know how much it costs to live in their areas, but in, in Pittsburgh, 80% of median income is still more than what most people make. Um, so, you know, we, we need to take avenues like that. We need to assure that every development is affordable instead of trying to empower city council people who may or may not have good intentions. Yeah, the, uh, 
the standard was 25% back in the 60s and 70s. And somewhere along the way, I, I can't remember, I think it was under Clinton, they raised the federal standard of affordability of 30% of your income. Um, but the numbers nationwide are about uh, a quarter, a half the people pay more than 30% of their income for their housing and a quarter pay over half their income, which means it's not affordable because, you know, once you pay the rent then you got to buy food, you got to keep your car running in most cases in order to get to work or school or get the groceries. Uh, Cause we got food deserts in our cities. I don't know about your district, but certainly in Syracuse, we don't have a grocery store in the city. You got to go to the suburbs for a real grocery store. We got corner stores with, you know, crap food, no fresh food. So, um, you know, that's that's a huge issue. And uh, one thing Pittsburgh had for a while was a, a land value taxation. And it seemed to have helped it, you know, make the transition from steel town to sort of eds and meds high tech town, which, you know, has fostered a well-rewarded middle class, but hasn't brought the working class up. Um, have you given thought to land value taxation as a way to limit how much uh, absentee landlords can extract from the community? Yeah, we've been exploring with um, you know folks that are adjacent to the campaign different solutions that would um, you know empower people to own their own homes. Um, Pittsburgh does have a land bank that uh, just has completely lost its its teeth. Um, really never had any to, to begin with. Um, but that's something that is already there, um, can be tweaked somewhat. Um, it would certainly be a fight because I'm sure there's a lot of people in power that don't want to see a project like that being successful. Um, but that that is uh, one mode. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do a lot with rent control because of um, you know certain laws uh, coming down from, from the state. Um, but yeah, that housing is um, <laughs> housing is is one thing that uh, I'm looking forward to working with partners and uh, you know learning more more about because you know we we need those sorts of levers like uh, different tax structures that will help us uh, you know keep our keep our neighborhoods the way that they're meant to be you know homes for people. Yeah, I should have said they had land value taxation and then it got repealed. And what land value taxation does is uh, it taxes the land underneath improvements. So improvements are taxed or they're taxed at a lower rate, which means improvements are encouraged and speculation is discouraged and sprawl development is discouraged. Compact development is encouraged. So you get walkable communities. And what it does is basically tax away a portion or all of the unearned income that landlords get. The value of land goes up and they didn't have to do anything to do it. Uh, increase that value in many cases because it was a public investment in roads or mass transit that made the land around those, uh, those transportation quarters more valuable. Or they're sitting on a piece of property and other investors, you know, put in stores or housing more people and the value of the land they own as John Stuart Mill said over a century ago, they make money while they sleep. They don't have to work for it. It's unearned. So land value taxation is part of a, you know, progressive and just track uh, tax system, in my opinion, and it's underutilized. And it's interesting that Pennsylvania is one of the few places in this country where it's been used. It's been used in many places around the world and had good results. So I have a question for you. Are you on the ballot as a green or a small eye independent? I'm on as a green. Yeah. Um, okay, good. We, we shared it on Twitter. We got our sample ballot in the mail and I uh, immediately shot it out to, to our team and uh, we shared it with the hashtag be seen being green. Um, I'm extremely proud of that. You know, I, I joined the green party for a reason and um, you know, having that, that, designation next to my name means means a lot to me yeah so we're on as a green yeah well the reason i asked is some states if you don't have a statewide ballot line you can petition to get on as an independent small i but you can't give it the green label in other states you can 
And apparently Pennsylvania is one of those states. New York is one of those states. But there are many states where you can't do that until you get a statewide ballot line, which is why, you know, that's one reason we need to get those ballot lines around the country. So when people go to vote, they know they're voting for Greens, not that's just right. some person that says I'm independent. And then what does that mean? And who are you really being backed by? So we've had independents here like John Galasano, the Paychecks Tycoon, you know, the, the payroll company. And he was a hard right winger. But because he had this independence label, uh, a lot of people said, well, he's neither Democrat or Republican. I'll give it a try without knowing what he stood for. Um, you know, if people have questions, write them in the chat and we will uh, ask them of Connor. Um, so you, you make mobility a big issue, you know, and that involves, you know, bikes and uh, walking. Uh, how about public transportation? What's going on in Pittsburgh with that? You yeah, know, great question. Light rails so, or buses. Uh, so our district is blessed to be one of the few places in the city of Pittsburgh that has access to the light rail line. Um, it's, it's basically a, a line from the center of town to the South Hills straight down, um, doesn't have any additional branches. We do have, uh, busways, which again, the Southern part of the city is blessed to have a branch of the busway, but then, you know, one that goes North, South, East and East and West connecting. So, um, we do have some public transit, arguably better public transit than some other parts of town. That being said the lines are not well connected. So if you live in between the trolley and the busway, you're probably walking over a mile to get to either of, of those nodes. Um, there's zero bike lane infrastructure on our part of town. Sidewalks are in just shameful states of disrepair. Um, so it's, it's kind of those last mile uh, trips that uh, our part of town struggles with. And then there's also an issue with um, the transit infrastructure itself. So um, bus stops, benches, um, bus lanes, those are things that the city of Pittsburgh controls. The Port Authority of Allegheny County is, is as the name would suggest, a county body. Um, so those are the things that I, I wanna try to improve, the things that the city does have control over, things like bus lanes could double as a, a bike and bus lane that works in other parts of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the stations, uh, all along Brownsville road and, uh, Brookline Boulevard and, um, Beachview Avenue is, uh, or excuse me, Broadway Avenue and Beachview is pretty, pretty well stocked with the trolley. But at any rate, the main business thoroughfares in, in our district, um, the, the transit stops leave a lot to be desired. Um, and those are things that, you know, I, I hope to improve. And um, it's been hard to watch over the last couple of months towards the end of summer, the, the city of Pittsburgh has launched a, a pilot program with a, a scooter company, an electric scooter company. And we see these things zipping around town, being left on sidewalks in parking spaces, bus lanes, bike lanes, going through the, the Liberty Tunnel, which is the thoroughfare, the, it's a state state highway that goes underneath a mountain into downtown Pittsburgh. People riding these electric scooters through this. The city is taking this insane risk, frankly, rolling this out, and yet you can't ride a bike safely on our side of town. Um, the, the priorities are just completely out of whack as far as mobility is, is concerned, at least on our side of town. Others, places that some folks would uh, call sort of favored neighborhoods of the city of Pittsburgh, um, have all sorts of great infrastructure, roundabouts, bike lanes, bike networks, bike racks, better transit, like eh, all of the things seem to be happening on other parts of town. We don't, we don't get that where I'm at, partially because nobody's advocating for it. You know, we don't have representation that will step up. Um, and that's something that's incredibly important to me, it's not just about safety or getting around town, but to your point, Howie, I, I technically live in a food desert. Um, I ride my bike to the grocery store or, or take the bus. Um, you know, I, I sometimes use a car. I don't always have access to one, but not everybody is, is as fortunate as that. Transit can be a way to, you know, shorten 
those trips to make everything closer. It's not just about relieving food deserts, but healthcare deserts, um, helping people get to work faster, school. It opens up a, a whole new world to, to people. And that's why transit is so important. It can be a really great equalizer in a lot of different ways. And we need someone that understands that, you know, electric cars aren't, uh, aren't going to be the, the answer to all of these questions, um, especially in the short term. I can't afford an electric car. Forget it. What, what's an electric car charger in downtown Pittsburgh going to do for me? Nothing. Um, and that's, that's more generally the case. Okay. Eric Gray asks, hey, Connor, what's your strategy for building political power in your community in order to organize and defeat more of these corrupt incumbents? That's a great question. Um, I mean, we, we have to just keep the momentum up. I think, um, you know, we've, we've opened up a lot of, uh, doors, a lot of new ideas for people in our side of town. Um, it's often considered one of the more conservative parts of town. Um, and there's not a lot of, uh, even progressive, I'm putting some of these words in, in air quotes for anybody that's listening later. Um, but you don't see a lot of quote unquote progressive activism happening in in our side of town and i think that's one of the reasons why we've been more popular is because we are engaging on ideas like demilitar de, <clears throat> excuse me demilitarizing the police taxing giant healthcare nonprofits safer streets you know people want to talk about these things but there's just not been an outlet or an infrastructure and we just have to keep doing it um, we've not quite gotten to that part of the campaign where we're thinking about after uh, the election day yet. But um, I think that's, that's, that's the only strategy that I see forward is to continue engaging our neighbors on all of these issues um, and continuing to build power and make friends and keep, keep it rolling. Hey, male sex, Connor, have you been able to get any good faith media coverage locally? Uh, great question. So, uh, there, everybody that's green is, is kind of aware of the sort of wall of silence, I guess, uh, you get as far as coverage goes. We have gotten some, um, to their credit, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review has covered us a couple of times. Uh, I believe, uh, when we announced our, our campaign, they covered us, um, when we, I want to say kicked off our general election campaign, they covered us as well. Um, but there, there's more coming. We've, we've been getting asks for interviews, um, really, I think even less than a, a week ago, um, we've been fielding more questions about interviews. So it's getting there. Um, it's certainly more than I would have expected based on my understanding of coverage of Greens in the past. So that's exciting too. Eric Gray. Also, have you thought about ways to enhance property ownership? especially within communities of color. Yeah, the, so that's one place where the land bank could be a huge help. Um, you know, essentially if anybody's not familiar with, with land banks, the way that they work is that, um, you know, city or municipality um, takes ownership of properties and, um, you know, it, it enters into this field of, of properties and then they're resold um, to people who, who need homes at, you know, very small amounts. Um, you know, that, that tool, if it can be leveraged correctly and, and built up, that could be a, a huge, um, a huge entryway into home ownership for, um, you know, people of color, poor people, people who've been pushed out of the city of Pittsburgh previously, they could come back. Um, Pittsburgh, it, like a lot of urban centers in America has a long history of pushing people out, particularly poor people and people of color. Um, you know, the land bank can be a, a really useful tool. Um, and that's something that I believe in. I believe it could work. It can also help with right sizing cities, um, which I think, um, I believe Syracuse or, or maybe Albany, um, somewhere up your way, Howie has, has had some success in right sizing through uh, land banking. I might be mistaken, but um, well, I'll, I'll tell you about Syracuse. Syracuse, yeah, the land banks bought a lot of property, but they're packaging it for developers. Mm. And 
you know, this neighborhood I live in, uh, about half the buildings or homes are abandoned. Basically, it's a black neighborhood now, was white, the white people move away and just rent them out till they, wear, you know, wear them out and then they're not habitable. Um, so the land banks come in and torn down most of those buildings instead of rehabilitated them. And uh, they're very aggressive. So they'll try to get, you know, five or six lots in a row. And then they're trying to package that for developers. Now, this city is so damn poor and broke that they haven't been able to sell many of those, uh, you know, lots that they've packaged to developers yet. But that's their plan. So I don't think it's helping with affordable housing, although it could. You know, if they, uh, you know, either rehab the buildings there or when they tear one down, put one up and make it affordable for uh, the people that live here. I think what we really need is is, is money in public housing in our public housing authority uh, that can do that. And, and actually, our public housing authority has done some of that. The problem is the scale is so small because the federal government and the state government haven't been supporting public housing basically since 1970. And uh, there is some money in this uh, reconciliation bill. At least there was originally. I don't know if it's going to survive the cuts they're making right now. Uh, but, you know, public housing is the most cost effective way to get affordable housing to the people because you don't have to deal with the developers and the landlords that want their cut and profit. You build it on a nonprofit at cost basis and you're providing a service at cost, not trying to make money off people and squeeze them for all they're worth like BlackRock is doing. So, uh, you know, land bank could be used well. I know Flint, Michigan has one. Um, and I've seen it described as the good things it could do. I haven't yet, to, I have yet to see it done that way. Partly right. because local politics in this country is dominated by the real estate industry. You know, you look at who's funding these campaigns, it's landlords and developers. And while I'm on my little stump, you know, one thing I think we should do as green candidates for local offices is say, our planning commission or department or whatever we got should do the planning and then put out bids and let the developers bid on building what we want. What happens now is the developers come to the planning commission and it gets rubber stamped because it's economic growth. And, you know, what they plan has nothing to do with, you know, rational uh, community enhancing urban planning. It's all about making money for the developer. So I think planning commission, and when we talk about a local Green New Deal, that should be the hub of planning the energy transformation and the walkable communities transformation and the public transit transformation. So the planning commission, uh, instead of being a rubber stamp, should be like a center where the community can come together and tell the people that build this stuff, here's what we want you to build, instead of just being a rubber stamp for what they want to build. Okay. Back to, back to you, Connor. Andy Messick, a big problem locally for me in Maryland is the underhanded anti-homelessness architecture where the Democrats running my local area put in various park benches with three arms on it to make it so the homeless can't lay on the bench and other things like that. Is this a problem in Pittsburgh and what sorts of things would you do instead of the anti-homeless policy I mentioned? Uh, before I answer that question, I just have to point out that I caught your uh, little picture there, Andy. Uh, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, uh, so that was very cool. Um, yeah, there it is. It, it seems to be Ahsoka holding Grogu. It looks like Anakin's uh, standing over top of him with the walker in the background. That's great. Um, so to answer your question, sorry to derail that. Uh, again, big Star Wars fan. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that uh, anti-homeless architecture, architecture or hostile architecture is a problem everywhere in every urban center. Um, I would I would like to see it banned outright. Um, I don't know what sort of language that would require, um, but I mean I think that the better question is I mean how do we get people in houses? You know to to Howie's point, I and I agree with you that. Public housing is, you know, really the, the best answer. Um, and I, I think that's true in, in Pittsburgh as well, although the public housing in, in the city of Pittsburgh is mired in all sorts of issues right now, too. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that hostile architecture is is shameful. Um, I I wish that it didn't exist, if if possible. You know, that's certainly something that I would hope to legislate out of existence. Um, but you know, getting people in homes, I think, is is the best you know solution. And keeping them in their homes too, for that matter. Jean Lowe's Pascalides, hope I pronounced that right. Uh, she asks, do you have a pet project for your district for, or for greater Pittsburgh? Um, I wouldn't call this a, a pet project. Um, something that I'm particularly passionate about. And there are people who do more work on it than, than I do. Uh, but there is a section of my district called Seldom Seen Greenway, which if you look at a map, it looks like any other huge park in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, but it's registered as a passive green space. So the city doesn't manage it. There are like deer trails and some well-maintained trails completely maintained by volunteers. Um, city provides no assistance whatsoever because it's classified as this passive green space. At the bottom of, this all sits up on a, on a hill, right? So at the bottom, there's a state highway, uh, five or six lanes across, and then uh, you get to the Mount Washington section of Pittsburgh, the back end of it, which if anybody's ever been to Pittsburgh, it's the part that kind of sits above downtown with the awesome views. At the bottom of that hill, there is a uh, transit tunnel. It's, it's really only used by Port Authority buses, um, but it's a straight line into the heart of the city of Pittsburgh. And uh, something that I advocate for in uh, my work as South Hills Safe Streets, um, as a bike pet advocate, is trying to get the city to actually maintain those trails, use that not just as a passive green space, because um, that's something else that's lacking in, in our district is big regional park. Other parts of the city of Pittsburgh have beautiful, well-maintained parks that have um, green space, playgrounds, basketball courts, tennis courts, you know, all of these awesome amenities really doesn't exist uh, on our end of town, but it could, or at least the trails part could, right? And that does a couple of things. It gives people green space where they can do hiking, biking. There's actually great uh, rock climbing in that part as well that people do kind of like gorilla style, I guess, climbing on these rock walls that used to be train trestles. Um, could be, you know, an awesome space if it were managed. In conjunction with that transit tunnel, it could also be a direct line for pedestrians and people walking and rolling straight into downtown, where now you're crossing uh, or walking down or, or past uh, huge state highways and the state of Pennsylvania is uh, trying and frankly failing to, you know, protect people that aren't inside of cars on, on their roads that they maintain. Um, so I, I would consider that a, a pet project, I guess. It's something that I care a whole lot about because I think our side of town really, really needs it. Um, something that we have big plans for, uh, this, the South Hills Safe Streets group that, that I helped co-found, we have big plans for continuing to advocate for that. And I um, hope I can get it done, you know, if, if uh, or sh I should say when, uh, when we get into city council, that's, that's something that, you know, I want to give particular attention to. <laughs> uh, that's cool, uh, Andy. Yeah, I, um, Dave Filoni grew up uh, not too far from where I live, and uh, if I would have been, if I would have foreseen talking about Star Wars, I would have worn my directed by Dave Filoni T-shirt. Um, so that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> well, I see in the chat, Scott Trooper. Scout Trooper 164, who's a regular on here, forgot and he, he uses the F bomb to uh, you know, express his frustration. But uh, Scout Trooper and everybody else, um, I'll be back on Monday night at 8 p.m. The Eco Action Committee of the National Green Party is having a uh, webinar 
it's uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, and we're going to uh, be talking with Dallas Goldtooth of the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, Mark Dunley of the New York Greens and the Eco Action Committee, and myself on uh, what we need to do now about climate change. And you got a foreshadowing of that in my first, uh, my opening. And uh, the information on that is now in the website where to register at. So I hope, uh, you know, many of you can make that. That's eight o'clock Monday night. It'll be up online somewhere uh, if you can't make that time. And uh, so Connor, before we uh, go, cause we're coming up on the hour, um, you want to say any last words for the folks about your campaign and how they can help? Yeah, uh, we are sort of a ragtag group of misfits, uh, you know, throwing this campaign together and, and really just dumping all our, our heart and soul into it. Um, but if you have the, the means, you know, we can certainly use donations. Uh, I think the, the uh, yeah, there's the link right there. Our uh, Connor or pgh.com slash donate. Um, again, we're, I'll reiterate, we're up against the uh, independently wealthy, good old boy incumbent, and every cent is going to count in this race. We're, we're certainly going to make good use of it. Uh, if you have the, the time and extra energy, and hopefully everybody, you know, was, was energized by the stuff that Howie and I talked about, you can go to that link below there, Connor for pgh.nationbuilder.com slash calendar. Um, and sign up for a phone bank. Uh, and then there's also door knocking events uh, on that calendar as well. So if you're in Southwestern Pennsylvania or Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia, pay us a visit. You know, we, we can use your help. Really any, any help, whether it's an hour of phone banking, you know, a couple dollars for, for a donation, you know, we, we need it. Um, and, you know, I, I want to say to how I, um, you know, if anybody's listening out there and is interested in running as a green, um, I've, I've gotten a lot of help, you know, not just from Howie, other greens across the country uh, were great resources for, for me. So I just want to open myself up. If anybody's considering running, especially if you're a young person, um, you know, the Green Party of Allegheny County, myself, my campaign staff are, are happy to help in any way that we can. Um, we, we need more people to run. If, if you want to change something in your community, your city, you can do it. You know, you just have to step up and run. And, you know, we want to facilitate more of uh, more people's runs like, like ours. Well, thank you, Connor. And uh, Lizzie Adams in the chat corrected me. I said Dallas Goldtooth from the Indigenous Environment Network. It's actually his father, Tom Goldtooth who will be on and is uh, really one of the people that originated the Indigenous Environmental Network, which has had a big impact on uh, the environmental movement, the climate movement, and uh, treaty rights, the whole work. So he's definitely worth uh, tuning in to hear. And uh, I, I think the last point I'll make is, is to just underscore what Connor said. Um, you know, we can't whine that you know, the politicians aren't being responsive when we have unopposed candidates that we don't run against. And people can get online, they can go to protests, but if we don't give people another option to vote for, the incumbents are going to ignore all that. You know, I like to use the example of the movement against the war in Iraq. In 2003, New York Times called us the world's second superpower, massive demonstrations all over the world. But because there wasn't a strong party on the left and the Greens were being vilified because of the 2000 election that NATO was involved in and the biggest coalition in the peace movement ended up endorsing Kerry, the Democrats just let that roll off their backs because we weren't threatening their votes. So if we don't do that, we got no right to complain. So I urge people to you know, look at your situation and start looking at races locally where you can run and we can win those because you don't need a lot of money, you know, in a district. How many people are in your district? How many how many votes will be cast in this election, Connor? Our, our win number is a little bit over 4,000. Okay, that is on a scale where the candidate and their volunteers can go knock on doors and talk to everybody. 
or or phone them, contact them one way or another. And that takes people power. You know, you can buy all the ads you want, but in a market like Pittsburgh, you can't target them for a district council race because the advertising is metropolitan. So, you know, they can pay a lot of money to consultants and they can pay people that are doing it because they're getting paid, not because they really believe in the cause. Whereas we have people that believe in the cause. We can beat these people and we have, we have many, <coughs> excuse me, we have many times. We actually have a pretty good win percentage in these local races. So that's just to encourage people. If we're going to, you know, get the things we need, whether it's climate or housing or immigration or police reform or whatever it is, uh, we got no right to complain if we aren't running our own candidates because otherwise we're going to be ignored. So that's a pitch to, you know, start looking at what you can do in your own community. And with that, thanks again, Connor. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we hope to see a lot of you Monday night. We're going to have a real good discussion on uh, climate policy and uh, what Indigenous Peoples Day means.